those who hate me, down to the third and fourth generations, but bestowing mercy down to the thousandth generation on the children of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so we can see there just a simple little curse and blessing um, for those who follow and love Yahweh, who follow the commandments of Yahweh. And so the next thing I want to take a look at is actually the, just the Ten Commandments itself. Um, these Ten Commandments are... I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. These Ten Commandments, for us, play a large role in sort of the, the laws that we see in the, our modern era. Um, they help form our society. And for the Israelites, that's what they were doing. They were helping them to form a society. And so when we look at these Ten Commandments, we can see that they are there trying to stabilize and to build a new nation. And when we do look at these, um, they will actually do a few radical things as far as um, the people of Mesopotamia were concerned. Moses went to the mountain, and God spoke unto him. Moses, this is the Lord thy God commanding you to obey my law. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you, I hear you. A deaf man could hear you. What? Nothing, I don't understand. forget it. Oh, Lord, why have you chosen me? What would you have me do for you? I shall give you my laws, and you shall take them unto the people. Yes, Lord! Wow. Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me! Oh, hear me! All oh, pay heed! The Lord, the Lord Jehovah! has given unto you these fifteen... Wait. Ten! Ten commandments for all to obey! Now, when we look at the Ten Commandments, um, and the word Ten Commandments, or the phrase Ten Commandments, is actually a horrible translation um, of what's going on in the, the Exodus text here. Uh, the phrase that's used, or the phrase that where we get this from, it actually says it's the ten words, or the ten proclamations um, that we have from, from Yahweh. And the reason I played that little, little skit there was, where do we get these ten commandments? Various different traditions look at the, um, the biblical witness and sort of delineate them in a variety of different ways. They all end up at 10, um, but they are delineated in a variety of different ways. And also, if you look at sort of the differences between the 10 commandments that are given in Deuteronomy and the 10 commandments that are given in Exodus, there's a few changes that you have to these commandments. Um, they're sort of a different set of commandments. Now, if we look here, um, we see the commandments that probably we've grown up with and we know. And we can see that the um, Jewish Orthodox, Roman Catholics, and then um, Anglican, Reformed, and other Protestant churches separate these in a variety of different ways. And it's usually, or it, as you can see, um, the disagreement is where you separate um, or whether or not you include some of the verbiage for um, describing the deity, describing Yahweh. Uh, and what, what should be done with this Yahweh. And then also, down at the end, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and thou shalt not covet, that, covet thy neighbor's wife. Um, you can see that in the Roman Catholic and Lutheran tradition, those are separated into two different commandments, and then in all the other traditions, those are actually squeezed together into one commandment. So let's look at the first commandment, or the first group of commandments. The first word, um, you shall have no other gods besides me. You shall not make for yourself a sculptured image or any likeness of what is in the heavens above or on the earth below. 
or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For the Lord your God, for I am the Lord your God am an, and am an, an impassioned God. So what we have here is a radical, radical break with sort of the understanding of the relationship between humans and the divine. In this um, commandment right here, we have uh, Yahweh declaring that he is so separate from all of creation, so transcendent above all of creation, that nothing, not even words, can describe this deity. And so we have a prohibition against the building up of any type of uh, uh, idol or sculptured image or anything that sort of represents this divinity um, for the Israelite people. And so you have this transcendent deity who is above all and um, incomprehensible, um, it, it, unable to be described uh, for these people. And then you have the next sentence that God is an impassioned God or a jealous God, which completely contradicts the statement right above it. This impassioned God, to be impassioned, to be jealous, uh, means that this God is in a relationship with the people. Now, the Hebrew word that they use there for impassioned or for jealous actually means to become red in the face. And it's used most often when describing sort of the emotions that one would have when um, they are filled with a, an extreme emotion, especially um, the emotion uh, that someone would have if um, they experienced adultery. This word is often used um, in context with people who are married um, and they become jealous. You know, they are uh, impassioned. Um, when the other person would step out or when the other person is, is um, you know, looking for someone else. And so we have this imminent God as well, right here in these first words. And so we have a tension already between the two types of deities that are being described. Um, this transcendent God and this eminent God, one that is in close relationship uh, with the people of Israel, but also one that is so far removed from all of creation, uh, this deity cannot be dis, um, put into any type of idol. And so this is a radical break from sort of what the, the other religions around Israel were doing. Now the next part of this, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, and upon the third and upon the fourth generations, of those who reject me, but showing loving kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, what would be the problem with this? Unfortunately, in other parts of the Bible, it says directly that this is not how, the, this is not how things work. So actually, let's look at Ezekiel 18.20. Only the one who sins shall die. The son shall not be charged with the guilt of his father, nor shall the father be charged with the guilt of his son. The virtuous man's virtue shall be his own, as the wicked's man wicked, wicked's net, wickedness shall be his. And so we have a complete reversal of what we just saw there. And so you can see um, this as sort of an example of various different authors coming together in this same biblical witness and putting together these tensions. Um, we saw already in the first, um, the first commandment the tension between a transcendent God and an imminent God, and we see here another tension of what type of God is this? Is this a God who is wrathful or a God who is just and will only bring about um, punishment for the